Hey, what's going on guys? This is Brown Simmons Comics and welcome to the newest edition of the CBSI Bolo Show. We got a great bunch of comics we're going to talk about tonight. And with me as always is my co-host Jack DeMeo, aka Mr. Bolo. What's going on, buddy? Hey, Brian, what's going on? You know, you said a bunch of comics, and I think that's an understatement because this list is huge. We had to break that tiny font out to make this work. So I'm excited to get into it this week. Right, so bring us both into the camera right now. And for those that aren't aware exactly, we are sponsored on this show by Nick Dwortman at SlabbedHeroes.com. Make sure you check out SlabbedHeroes.com for guaranteed 9 8 at a guaranteed great price. And as we always say, bulletproof packing. You'll be certain that this book will arrive safe, uncracked, and well protected. And in addition to that, this show is available in the audio version. We have it up there on the Simple Man's Comics podcast, available on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. So we'll bring up this week's Bolo list. And like we always say, if this is your first time on the show, first, make sure you click that subscribe button so that we'll never miss a future video. But the Bolo list, it's the be on the lookout list that comes out each week from Jack DeMeo. Hits Instagram Tuesday nights and social media all over the place. But he covers first appearances Reader buzz, variant buzz, and offers a long-term play. And that's what we're going to discuss tonight, right, Jack? This whole list? Yes, this monster of a list, uh, which I think plays well into our first book on the list. Right, so getting into it, we're going to cover first appearances first. And the top book on the first appearance list is Gotham City Monsters number one. Yeah, this is a book I haven't gotten to read yet, Brian, but this book seems kind of cool to me. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the Marvel monsters, and I think that that has... It's funny the way the, the big two publishing houses tend to like to play off of each other when one person's doing something and maybe they get a little success, the other person goes with it. We see that with the Contagion storyline following up DC's success with Deceased, and now we see Gotham City monsters where you've got kind of your monster-esque characters that tend to roam gotham city put together in a team now if you know anything about me you know i'm not a big team appearance guy um I've talked about that a lot on the show but i gotta admit I i'm tentatively cautious but I i'm kind of interested in this one um it i like i've often felt like the justice league dark type stuff the uh the kind of uh dark horror occult stuff that dc does could be successful at some point um and Brad, how many times on this channel have we talked about horror being hot in comics? So this one, if it's done right, could could find its place. But i got to read this book to really understand where it's going to kind of fall in line with the rest of the DC Universe, especially in Gotham City. Right. I think this is one of the books that's going to probably mostly fall within the great read story than rather than the great spec. But it does look like a fun read. What do you got? Like, um, was it Lady Clayface? Frankenstein? Orca, um, huge team up type right there. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read this yet. It is in my pickup pile, but it was on my weekly picks as well. So I'm definitely looking forward to picking this up. I just don't see this unless there's some weird first appearance that's going to come out of nowhere. Well, besides the team that you have on the list for, but this is one that who knows might sit in a, in a short box for a while and then something pop off later on down the road. Either way, it looks like a fun read. But you have it on this list for that team being the first appearance. Right. All right. This is, I could see an animated play before I could see an actual, say, movie appearance. But you never know. they got to get Justice League Dark going first. And then if Justice League Dark is going, books like this have a shot. But it would be a long-term play at best. Well, the good thing is if it's animated and it's DC, it, it's, it's got to – at least the movie will be good because DC usually knocks those animated features out of the park. Right, they gotta get them in theaters though, like yeah. Edge of the Spider Verse. Yeah, the animated movies don't. Or don't, Spider Verse. Yeah, animated movies definitely don't move the spec needle, but they're actually really fun to watch and enjoyable. Yeah. But the next book you had this week on the confirmed first appearances was Miles Morales Spider Man number ten. We've talked about this book, this title a lot on this show. What was the big first appearance in this book? Well, this is I believe Ultimatum um, is the character's name. Um, but to be honest with you, I don't know if this is really as much popular for Ultimatum's first appearance as it is for that origin of Starling, who is a character that a lot of people are specking on. Um, and it's interesting looking at 
how this book is selling for at least right now. Because if you look right now, cover A is at about ten dollars, which is you know about two and a quarter times or two and a half times cover price. But both the one in twenty five and the one in fifty variant are selling below ratio. Um, the <clears throat> excuse me, the immortal variant is selling pretty briskly, but it's selling at cover price plus shipping. Now again, we talk about this on the show. Cover price shipping still is essentially twice cover price to the person who's purchasing it, unless they're buying multiple copies from the same dealer, which they may be doing. That's the smart way to do it. But I think that's more of a fan favorite type book more than it is a spec play. But it's interesting to me that that cover A is the one that people seem to be gravitating towards over those high ratio variants, 125, 150. Right. The one, um, the, the cover in the middle for the solicit, I saw some places that has solicited and then some places that didn't until like actual release day. So I was like weird in the weekly picks I even talked about. I was like, hey, I'm seeing this cover, but I'm seeing some places that don't even have it listed for sale. So it's one thing I was like, maybe it's out there, maybe it's not. But new comic book day comes out and that answers all questions. So it's definitely out there. This is definitely one I always say I enjoy reading this title right now better than the regular Spider-Man. Miles Morales has been always great. But... There's also people specking on this, especially with um, Spider-Man number, Spider-Man two number ones and and stuff like that, right? Right, definitely. And you know, Ultimatum is the Miles Morales of the six one six. We saw that doppelganger first appearance be popular. So it seems like they, they're going with a similar trope of like other versions with the evil Miles, um, similar versions of Miles. Seems like Marvel's really trying to find a villain that they can kind of latch on to or, you know, another, um, care, other characters and not to be a villain. Um, but another characters that they, that they can kind of world build around miles. And I think they're just throwing a lot of darts out there to see what sticks. All right. And then moving on to the last book in the first appearances this week was Swordmaster number three. It had the regular, and then there was also a one in 25 and Cine variant, right? Right, right. So this one is one that I'm a little interested in. Um, I'm going to get uh, beat up probably for pronunciation, but it's like Chai Yu. Um, and this is the uh, the God of War. And, you know, Swordmaster is one where there's little interest on this series as for a spec play. But the people that have been reading it have been kind of championing this series. I've heard a lot of people kind of, the gro- I don't want to say a lot, but there's a groundswell of people who are starting to get behind Swordmaster as a character. And, you know, again, we, I just mentioned world building. You've got to build these characters' worlds out. You've got to build their villains. They've got to build their um, cohorts. And Swordmaster, again, falls into that, you know, the Asian kind of culture of of characters that we know the MCU is move, moving into with, um, you know, Shang-Chi. 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 I'm going to pronounce that wrong. Pronounce that one wrong get killed. But we know that uh, Marvel is, is moving into. So, again, I think Asia is like their second biggest market outside the United States. Um, there's no doubt that they want to, just looking at the publishing and where they've gone with the new releases, I definitely think that's where they want to uh, put their emphasis and effort. So, Swordmaster is a series that, um, you know, I'm kind of paying attention to. And I think that variant cover is amazing. Right. And that's going to bring us to the end of the first appearances for this week's Bolo List. Real quick, before we go over into the reader buzz, I want to thank everyone that's in the chat right now. Also, just keep in mind, this is pre-recorded. We recorded this last night, Wednesday night, September 11th. But we always live premiere it. That way we can participate in the live chat. So we thank everyone that's in the chat right now. We thank everyone that's clicking that thumbs up button for us. And if you haven't done so, like we said before, please make sure you click that subscribe button and the bell notification as well. So you'll always be notified when future videos get released. Yeah, and I think it's also important to note before we move on to like the reader buzz section that there are a few first appearances that came out um, in yesterday's books that were not on the bolo list. And again, it's important. We talked about last week about um, a book that we got wrong um, and why why it was wrong. Um, and, you know, it's important to note that we take these first appearance confirmations seriously been wrong before but we want to minimize that as much as possible um and you know this was a huge list also so we wanted to try to focus on those major ones that seem to get people's attention so um you know that that's why there may be appearances that you know we didn't realize until these books hit newsstands uh included first appearances right 
And with that being said, we're going to go right into the Reader Buzz section. And the first book on the Reader Buzz this week was that Zenoscope book, right? Watcher number two. Right. There's, there's solid buzz on this book. Uh, two, two releases in a row. Um, people seem to be watching Watcher. Um, you know, number one, I, I think that was hitting like what, Brian? Like 10 to $15 uh, for that one. Um, I don't know what number two is selling for, but it was limited at Midtown to one per customer. So I know that people were buying it, at least in anticipation. Um, just did a quick eBay search, and it looks like, eh, you know, maybe a little over cover, um, but not so too much. I think this is reader buzz more than it is speculation. Number one may have been speculation on the series. Number two seems to be, I think, people read number one, seem to be interested in it, so they're, they're getting on board with number two. But... You've mentioned this before. Zenoscope has had some success recently with some series outside of their normal like TNA style releases, and they've had a couple issues do well. The key is going to be: can they maintain the success? Can they can they put together a series that people want to read, kind of all the way through? Right. Um, I don't I don't see it being sustained, but I will say that the cover art on both, both of these issues that I've seen, both the A and B cover, has been fantastic. In fact, I think i have a feeling that we're going to be talking about issue number three tomorrow night i think so but but we'll see about that and um yeah like i'm of a, a self-admitted zenoscope vip but but most of that i do for the the paul green variants and the their exclusive variants more so than the actual titles i did read issue number one i actually did enjoy it but like you said and we just said it before is uh, will that hype be sustainable? And I, I don't think it. I, th- I don't think it will be by issue number five. It'll probably die down. I hope I'm wrong, but we'll see. Then the next book on the reader buzz section is Canto number four. Canto number four. Now this is obviously a series that we have talked about a lot. I really love the cover art on that one in ten incentive variant. Um, I think that that is one of the kind of like more, I mean, uh, there's been so many covers in the sheets, especially those late printings and the incentives that have been amazing. Um, but I think that's one of my favorites that I've seen. I just think the, the sky background is incredible. And now, of course, our man Tover S from comicbookinvest.com, writer of the, um, the True First column, the creator of the term True First, he um, he obviously, he's been anti-Canto. He put this on his cold pick. Um and I said it'd be interesting to see how we kind of keep going. I think we're not going to see any bounce back effect probably till issue five when we see the orders for three and four. They were kind of lumped together. So I expected this one to do similar to what three did. And that's about what we're getting. Cover A isn't necessarily drawing a ton of interest other than cover price. Uh, the incentive, though, is slowly rising. We're seeing prices go from... The first copies that hit eBay were going for about $10 plus shipping. So, you know, a little over um, ratio being a 110 cent. The last copy to sell was $20. So we've kind of gone up the ladder uh, from $10 to $15 to $17 up to $20. Now, it'll be interesting to see as people get their online orders and start listing them. Does that price drop? But most of the copies now listed on eBay are at about the $20 to $25 range. So I think that incentive has a little bit of more of a bounce back from issue three. And again, I wasn't trying to down the cover art of issue three, but I, I think that that the issue three incentive cover art hurt itself. And I think that, again, this is one of the better ones that we've seen. So, I, you know, and I have high hopes for the issue number five with Ben Bishop on the cover. Right. And while it's hot or not, I still enjoy the story. Uh, oh, I'll yeah. continue to pick it up. Um, like me personally, I I like this book so much that I like to see Canto become like the little mascot of IDW. And next thing you know, now up in the corner art for the IDW logo, you have a little Canto guy up there. Um, but I just enjoy the story that much. I'm not sitting here trying to push it on that or anything like that. But yeah. I enjoy the books. I'm going to continue to pick it up, spec or not. It's it's well worth it. It's always in my pull list. Um and if you haven't, I at least recommend giving it a read and see what you guys think. And if you have yeah. been reading it, let us know in the comments what you guys think about Canto. Yeah, so if you're not specking on this one and you just want to see why we've been talking about it so much, you know, that trade will be, you know, it's only a six-issue miniseries. That trade will be coming before you know it. 
um, give it a shot. Check it out because I've enjoyed it so much. It's, it's like you mentioned about the mascot. I would buy Kanto if it was a Funko Pop. I would buy a Kanto T-shirt. Um, David Boer, Drew Zucker, if you're watching, I would buy a T-shirt. I would buy a Funko Pop. I would buy whatever you guys put out because I've enjoyed this story. And I think, uh, again, it would make a great animated film, great Pixar-style movie. Um, you know, I, I like it. I have enjoyed, I've really enjoyed it. It's delivered from issue one through issue four. Right. Again, stressing. Buy what you like. We're not pushing this title on you. We just enjoy the story. So if you don't have any interest in it, then so be it. But either way, we're going to move on to the next one. And the next one is from Scout, right? And we're talking about Midnight Sky number one. This kind of made a debut in the Free Comic Book Day book, right? They had issues like right. three different stories in there. Right, yeah. And you know what? And that's the funny thing is so many people were... T now, this had also the cover art of the Free Comic Book Day right. um, issue. And so many people were pay bought that. And that Free Comic Book Day issue had like a moment in the sun um, when there, people thought that maybe it was Gut Ghost's first appearance. And of course, my man, Topher Ash from True First, you know, he, he illustrated how many Gut Ghost appearances appeared prior to the Gut Ghost Scout Comics release. But I checked out that Free Comic Book Day issue, and as soon as I read it, I was like, oh man, Midnight Sky looks cool. Um, I think it's a long term spec play. Uh, people are buying it. That cover C seems to be doing pretty well. Um, selling about $15 or so, which was interesting because Mid I think Midtown had them for cover. This is the thing that was throwing me off. Is Midtown had them for cover, but they're being listed everywhere on eBay as 1 in 10 variants. So I, I was really kind of thrown off by, was there a miscommunication there? But I know that some books that Scout does, they're, they're unique in the way that they do them in that, like, if you can order as many as you want, so long as you order... Like, if you order 20 cover A's, then you can order as many cover B's as you want. And if you order 20 cover B's, you can order as many cover C's as you want. And it may have been one of those type of releases. If there's any retailers in our chat, let us know. I know um, we've got a few of you guys out there that watch. Um, and I did put an order in for a book similar to that. It might be this one. To be honest with you, this is how sometimes unorganized I get with my pre-orders. That uh, I remember there was a book of that sort that I that I put a pre-order in. This might have been it. Um, I hope it is because this book is doing pretty well. Um, but I like the cover art on cover C. Um, this book in the solicit, they they kind of advertise it as Invasion of the Body Snatchers meets They Live. Um, those are two movies I thoroughly enjoy. Um, so, you know, I, I think that this is one that has a shot as far as adaptation. Um, the owner of Scout Comics, James Hake, has been very aggressive with getting his properties in front of... Um, you know, Hollywood types. So that's issue number one. I'm interested to read it. Haven't read it yet. Let us know in the chat if you read it, what you think. But we talked about this horror, kind of sci-fi suspense. This stuff is hot. This stuff is, is what people want to see. Right. I think I think there's no denying Scout Comics has really great stories. For some reason, they don't. It's, I see it. It's also like same way Zenoscope does. Some of these books take off high, but they never seem to sustain that value, which is kind of weird. I'm waiting for that one scout title to like make that change to where it it, it takes off and, and, and stays up there in value. Right now, great stories from Scout, but they haven't been great as far as a spec play to that ultimate, I won't say long term, but you know, within one to three years, that still retains the value that it was when it took off. And be anxious to see if that which book I, there's going to be one from scout that does and i'm anxious to see which book that that's going to be yeah and, and and you know i think it may be one of those things where it may not be a book that it like builds reader buzz organically i think it because they're so aggressive with getting their properties option it may be a book where when the mall becomes say a television series if it, if it becomes a hit television series people may run back and grab those issues versus that organic reader buzz i don't know but uh yeah J james hake is one of those guys he's an aggressive businessman he's a good he, he, he's got a good mind for the business yeah great guy great stories um we, we enjoyed having him on on the channel before and if you're unaware we did have an interview with james hake it's on the channel uh we'll put a link to the video in the description of this, of this video if you guys want to check it out but we're going to move on into the reader buzz. And the next book was Captain Marvel number 10. Now this one, one has the gorgeous Mark Brooks cover. But there's also some more in it with Star, right? Right. This this is 
kind of that moment you've been waiting for, that Captain Marvel versus Star battle. And uh, it did not disappoint. I think um, readers are hooked into this story. We've been talking about this now three issues in a row. Brian, have we ever talked about Captain Marvel three issues in a row? No. I mean, I, I, I really can't ever think of a time. And then somebody asked me on the CBSI Facebook group um, what I thought about the um, the dark Captain Marvel stuff that's coming with issue 12. And I think that we're going to find out in these next couple issues where that's even coming from. Um, and because of that, I expect this book was heavily speculated on because Mark Brooks put the tweet out saying that this was the debut of Star, which obviously wasn't two issues ago that happened. But I, what he meant by that is this is the issue where really we get to see who Star is, um, what she has um, working for her and, you know, her and her full glory. And there was kind of that issue eight, she debuted, issue nine, she barely shows up. Um, issue 10, now we've got, you know, that full Star. I wonder if Star becomes a huge character, Brian. We talked about, on this channel, what have we talked about? Like death to cameos, uh, you know, a first appearance is a first appearance. And uh, comics politics. Will people say 10 years from now, if Star becomes a big thing, right? She's the main villain for Captain Marvel. Will people call this a first full appearance? I could honestly see that. Because you're talking about small appearances in 8 and 9. Um, now, 8, I feel like, is such a solid appearance. I don't know how you can argue that's not a first appearance. But still, people tried to make that argument going into issue 9. People tried to say that it wasn't a first appearance. It was a cameo. So um, issue number nine would be the first appearance, but in issue number nine, she was really just a background character. She was like flying in one panel in the background. So I wonder if people won't make that argument. But to me, the the news of this issue is the fact that we are building a, a run. There's a run being put on in this series because people are interested in this dark Captain Marvel, which starts with issue 12. And you got to look, you got the debut of a new character in eight that took the, the speculation world by storm. Issue number nine, people jumped on to see what would happen with that, you know, new character. And we end up getting the death of Dr. Minerva. Issue number 10, we get the first real battle between Captain Marvel and Star. I think issue number 11 is going to give us a clearer picture about where we're going with Dark Captain Marvel. And issue number 12, we've got Dark Captain Marvel. Issue number 11 could be the appearance of Dark Captain Marvel. So, and then you've got the Dark Captain Marvel story going from 12 on. I think we may be talking about Captain Marvel all winter, Brian. Right. And one thing I, I mean, I've said it before, I'm still not a big fan of Captain Marvel. But one thing I can respect about this is a lot of this is being spec off the story and not like the movie or the MCU or, I mean, yeah, they see it coming to the MCU, but it's not like the riding the coattails of the Captain Marvel movie or the Avengers movie, this is all story-driven spec with a new fresh character that's showing up in the actual book that they I can see getting carried over to the MCU, so there's some attention there. But I like seeing that it's specifically tied to the book itself right now. Yeah, and I'll go out on a limb, Brian. You know, I, I was agreeing with you. If you remember, Bolo Nation, CBSI Nation, Simpleman's Comics Family, go rewind back to when we debuted that um, first appearance of... Uh, of Star in issue eight. Um, I was very negative about that. I was very negative about that not being a great spec play. Um, why are people paying $25? So many new characters come out. This has been like the perfect run of issues in my mind. Like you said, new character debuts. Then you have a death of a major character. Um, it looks like it really amplifies this new character's debut. Um, you have great storytelling. Now with Mark Brooks jumping on covers, you got great cover art. You've got definitely good art on the inside i shouldn't even say good because it almost sounds like i'm downgrading it but it's like you can't compare it to mark mark brooks on that cover um and then this i thought the second print for captain marvel number eight while largely printed and probably not more than a long-term spec play is a perfect second print cover you get the character that first appears in the book on the cover gorgeous cover that is how you do it um so I look at whoever is editing and in charge of, like, this book in total. I'm mean, Hats off to you. This is how you do it. So I totally agree with you. This is the most organic buzz being built around a character. And I agree with Brian. It's a character that I don't pay any attention to. I don't really care. I mean, I enjoyed the movie. But I don't really care. I, I don't think I've ever read Captain Marvel comics at all. Um, and I this is one that I will pick up 
at this point, every month going forward, to, at least until they lose me. Um, but I'm interested to read this one when it comes out now. Yep. So, you know, that's how you win over fans. That's how you win over customers. And that's how you create long-term buzz. So it'll be interesting to see if they can keep the run going, a la, say, Venom or Immortal Hulk. Will this become a run of that nature? Or is this just a cool couple stories? Yep. I did read the, um, the f- first 10 issues of was it Kelly Sue DeConnick who was writing it in 2011, right when yep. they switched over to the first Marvel Now, not the Marvel Now, 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 but I enjoyed the first few issues of that, and then it kind of fell off, and ever since then I haven't been a big Captain Marvel reader, but I, re- I respect it and, and, and see where it's going there and admit that there's some good spec going on there. But... Next book we're going to talk about in the Reader Buzz is Powers of X number four. Every week we're talking House of X, Powers of X. There's no doubt. This is just a, uh, as consistent of a title as it gets, whether it's House of X or Powers of X. And again, so I think for the, for the sake of brevity and the length of the show, I'm not going to go into a lot of this, but I'm just going to say clearly uh, Jonathan Hickman has a hit on his hands. Um the connecting covers do well every time. The flower variants do well every time. Um, the the Huddleston story, variants do well. Yes, the Huddleston variants, variants do well. Um, I'm seeing retailers mark those up a bit now as those come out. Um, but, yeah, I mean, this this, this story is a monster. Um, this is going to be a trade that sells exceptionally well. Um, and this is going to be a set that I think people are going to want to put together, the 12 issues. And it's going to be a classic. But we're going to move into the next book, and this is another book that was highly talked about. We're talking about Venom number 18. Was this the most maybe talked about? No, not maybe. This was the most talked about book this week. Um, This is an example of the flow of information. So you have have Marvel putting out uh, panels from the book. And we talked about that on this channel. Um, and we talked about uh, it on comicbookinvest.com and Marvel clearly wanted you to think that Dylan was going to bond with Sleeper now again we didn't say Dylan was going to bond with Sleeper we simply said this is what it looks like what do you think this does for spec Um, and then it was reported by another source who out of respect I'm just going to say it was reported by another source that some events happen that didn't end up happening. Um, and it's tough because when you only get like a page, you're trying to speculate. So yeah, speculate on what happens in that page. So um, everybody's been real tough on the, the this source and how they handled it. Um, and I've been critical of this source and other sources before. But I actually got to cut them some slack because it, it, I don't know the story. I don't know how how they got their information. But if all they were given was that one page, they basically reported it how that one page looked. Um, The only way they could have done it differently, I think, would have been to say, um, you know, that to to kind of preface it by saying that they don't know that for sure, but this is the way it's looking. Similar to what, you know, we tried to do with the information we had on Sleeper and Dylan. Um, But, you know, this is the way this stuff goes, and this stuff was leaked out. So we had multiple levels of unintentional misinformation, whether it was put out by Marvel, whether people leaked parts of the story, whatever it was. In the end, what we end up getting is the maker uh, bonding with the symbiote hybrid. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically like exactly kind of what it sounds like. It's it's a hybrid symbiote of all these different symbiotes. Um, it's a uh, character I wasn't really familiar with, and this is this is Donny Cates, man. Donny Cates pulls out those back issues. He he pulls from different places. Uh, they said every symbiote was going to be involved in the story. It looks like they were not lying because this was not a symbiote I was even aware of. Um, I'd have to I I'd, I'd honestly have to check out with my brother Mark Defiant because he's uh he's my symbiote expert. But I, this one caught me off guard. But it's kind of cool. Um, we knew the maker was up to no good, right? We knew the maker had his own plan. And then the next thing is, I, as I read this issue, Brian, did you read this one? I haven't read it yet. 
see, as I read it, it looks like Sleeper's dead. That's what it looks like from it. But I don't want to go so far as to say that because it's comics and we know how these things roll and we're supposed to be see things a certain way. Maybe Doesn't Sleeper's mean... just sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's funny because maybe Marvel teased the Dylan Sleeper angle because that could still happen. Um, maybe just the host is dead. I don't know. I don't know how I don't know how that whole thing is going to play out. But the point that we were trying to originally ask when it comes to this issue is what happens with that sleeper spec. Um, you're talking about a book with that second print of Venom first host number three, a book that was selling for a hundred dollars down to about seventy. I think we could see like a serious crash of that book, quite possibly. There's still a lot of people out there saying, you know, it's still solid spec, but you can't tell at this point. Do people really believe that, or are they protecting investments that they've made? And I'll tell you straight up, I don't, I don't have that book, so I'm not invested in that book either way. I don't really care either way. I'm, I'm really curious because I think that I, this is what I, one of the things as a, aside from like personal speculation, which I've gotten kind of out of like speculation and more into the retail side of comics as I like do more shows and try to build up a business. Um, it. This one's interesting to me as test case as what we do here on the channel with Brian and I. Uh, we talk about comics on a weekly basis. We try to follow trends and report on trends. This is why this issue interests me the most is because it, it kind of lets us see this is this is a book that rose to me, you know, meteoric rise. And did it kind of rise too fast when we haven't really seen where the story's going to go? And the bottom line is this absolute carnage story is going to have so many twists and turns in it. More things are going to happen. Um, you know, it's going to be wild. But that Codex variant that you see on the upper right um, has had solid buzz on it. Um, it's a 1 in 25 variant. All the Codex variants have done pretty well. This one's done real well going into the release of this issue. Um, I, I don't know if it'll drop a bit as people kind of read the issue and maybe are a little disappointed that they didn't get, like, the first appearance of Dylan and whoever he's going to be. Um I think that that furthers the speculation that issue nine is going to be the issue to get, which or nineteen, which we're seeing um, a lot of talk about leading into Venom nineteen. Um, but this book is going like ten dollars over ratio. This one twenty five already. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what direction it goes. And then the Immortal variants. The Immortal variants have been more popular than people anticipated, and this is one of the more popular ones um, because it just naturally plays into Eddie and Venom and the you know the whole symbiote relationship right and i wouldn't sleep on um was it asm 30 also we've been talking about that's actually coming yes. out before number 19 and it's got the absolute carnage tie-in so depending on how all these books tie in and and so forth not a big asm fan but asm 30 we mentioned how that wraparound there was no cover art for it so who knows i still think it's gonna be normie osborne on that wraparound but we'll see right and then you know and bottom line is Venom 18 was so feverishly purchased for people to read this story that the book's going for over cover price. Yeah. So this is true reader buzz, true reader buzz built. Um, it'll be interesting to see where the prices go long term, but I think this is uh, this run is going to be epic. This Venom run, this absolute carnage run is going to be epic. Right. Then the next book we have for the reader buzz will be... Uh... <laughs> Absolute Carnage tie-ins. This is one that I got asked a lot about for comments on the weekly picks. Like, how come you didn't have the tie-ins? I kind of mentioned them. Um, mentioned on this show before, I'm not a huge tie-in person. I did read the first Carnage vs. Deadpool. And after that, I was like, eh. So, wasn't really into them. I have heard good words about the, the Symbiotes of Vengeance. What we have on the screen now is basically the cover A and then also the... The variant, uh, well, they both were incentive variants for him, right? Right. Right, and, you know, I agree. I tend to agree with you. We've talked about this plenty. Um, I tend to agree with you when it comes to the tie-ins. I think that th this is the first time, I think, in my life yeah. where I'm dedicatedly reading all of the tie-ins as they come out. Um, and I just feel good if I buy one issue of cover A of each of the tie-ins. I'm going to be able to lock these up together when I'm all done reading them and sell them and get my money out of them because I think people are going to want that set. But um, 
there was a lot of talk about the Spirits of Vengeance book, the Symbiote of Vengeance book, um, but their variants are doing below ratio, so it didn't quite do what people would hope. Very few of these ratio variants have done well um, from these tie-ins because I don't think this is a spec play. I really truly think that this is more of a reader buzz play. So because of it be, and that's why it's in this category, and because it's in the, you know, reader buzz can turn into spec, but incentives are meant to be spec from the get-go. And that's certainly, you know, not what we're seeing right off the bat with uh, with these. Um, and there was a 1 in 100 for Symbiote's Avengers. So they really were trying to get, um, get retailers to jump on board. But um, gorgeous cover art. Uh, definitely two books I'll be reading and checking out. Um, I'm all in on Absolute Carnage. No, like I said, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't big on the tie-in, but seeing Symbiotes of Vengeance, is that like including Spirits of Vengeance? Or is that just Ghost Rider? Or what is there, three different Ghost Riders in this I heard? or Yeah. Yeah, and I, like, I haven't checked out this book yet, but that, that's why I think it's like three different Ghost Riders in this book. Right. So, so it's definitely in the reader buzz section. I like I always say with the tie-ins for me, as you, I'm a trade or omnibus type guy. So if it's going to be tie-ins, I would go back and hopefully they would have an omnibus for it that would include them and that I'd catch up on it then. Other than that, I'm usually just the main story guy for events and I stick with those. But next on the reader buzz, we had Silver Surfer Black Number Four. And here we get kind of like a retelling origin of Galactus. You know, this is Donnie Cates' kind of virgin, virgin, version. Um, and uh, I think this is an example of like Trad Moore, who was like really kind of like hated on when he first got announced as the artist to this. Really kind of showing why Donnie Cates, I don't know if it was his pick, but... Um, that, it seems like the way he goes with Marvel, this would, you know, he would get to make that pick. But why this team works, because this, this the cover art for cover A really reminds me of those epic uh, um, Silver Surfer issues like in the past. 50 through 54, whatever, right? Yeah, 48. Lots of right, lots of color. Um, you know, um, back when they were doing like the Infinity Gauntlet stuff, Infinity Wars stuff, um, lots of color. Um, real kind of classic, it's classic to me. It's, I know if you were a Silver Surfer fan back from like the Fantastic Four days, um, you may feel differently. But for somebody my age who grew up reading those Silver Surfer issues, and that was like my first exposure to Silver Surfer as like a main character, th- it, to me this is very familiar. Um, I was kind of expecting the 1 in 25 Peach Momoku variant to do better than it's done. It's yeah. done a little bit below ratio. I Just because Null is on the cover. But I think we're maybe getting a little Null overkill with like cover appearances. Um, and then the Immortal variant, I think it's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that's an interesting concept. Alex Garner, and I'm usually a big Alex Garner fan. It's just I kind of shied away from a lot of the Immortal wraparound variants. Minus one that we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Yes, I already know which one you're you're hitting at. But so then the next one we have is Batman number seventy eight. Now this was one book I actually did read, and um, I was like, it was it wasn't very good. There you go. That's the second appearance of the fart sound on the Bolo <laughs> show. But yeah, um, your sentiment, Brian, is basically everybody's. Um, people did not like this issue, um, and it's one of those examples of like. You're coming off a really hot issue, right? You're coming off an issue that had everybody's attention. That is your opportunity to capitalize on it. Now, these things are planned well in advance. They don't always know what's going to be hot, but they should have known that 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 Alfred and Bane scene was going to really draw reader attention. And they did not retain that reader attention with this issue. Um, Brian, you mentioned in your review when you and I were talking... You felt like just nothing really happened in this issue. And that seems to be the way people feel about it. Yeah, it was like Batman, Catwoman, Temptation Island with some Magnum P.I. mixed in. Like, <laughs> it was, yeah, I was expecting it to pick off where, pick up where the last issue left off. And it was, um, it's kind of like how people felt about kind of the last couple seasons of Walking Dead where it was like a lot of story filler. 
and not like get to the action that you want to see. But yeah, I wasn't too uh, too impressed with the issue. Yeah, and then, like I said, that seems to be everyone's kind of feeling on this one. So yeah, I think I think uh, DC missed an opportunity here to like like we just talked about Captain Marvel where you build on a big issue. I think they missed an opportunity to do that. Right. Then we're going to move on to the next book in the Reader Buzz, and that was Squirrel Girl, number 48, right? Yeah, and this is what I think the last issue in the run. Um, and it's funny because it's not a book on my radar, but uh, multiple people were pointing this book out as a – I heard it was a possible first appearance in here. Um, let us know in the chat. This is not a book I read, uh, so let us know in the chat if you know we're missing something here. But um, this is one that – the solicitation was hard selling when I looked at it when I was trying to figure out why why were people talking about this book? That's what happens a lot of times books get posted and then I've got to try to chase and find out well why are people talking about this before I get on the mic? And um, you know, I saw like, okay, this is the last issue. Um the I know that the story has really surrounded this Doctor Doom versus uh Squirrel Girl story. Um if you're not familiar with Squirrel Girl, she's basically the most powerful character in the Marvel Universe. So she does. She does, does battle with Doctor Doom, with Galactus, with um, Thanos, which sounds ridiculous, but it that's reality. That's that's the character. Um, and, you know, like a lot of issues, I think that it may be underprinted. So it was on my radar once I saw as many people talking about it because I just wondered, well, you know, if anything does happen in this issue... This book has a chance to pop. Now, looking at sales of it before we recorded this this episode, it's basically cover price plus shipping. But I will say there's only a few of these books listed. So, yeah, I don't think this is a hugely printed book. So if it does get some late-breaking first appearance, something that a character shows up in this book that then shows up later in another book and pops off, anything's possible. Yeah, what is this book? Probably one of those ones that's probably about, what, 20000 maybe? I'm not sure. If, I don't follow. If that, yeah, if that. Yeah, I was thinking. I'm thinking like 17 to 20, but we'll see. But, but the next book I definitely know about was my pick of the week, and so far, it's been my read of the week. Having said that, I've only read three books so far, but absolutely love this. The Zafino variant, which is in the middle on the bottom, was my pick of the week for the week, but was able to read this today. Fantastic issue. Nice. Last page has a big, I don't want to say reveal, but we do get someone on there on that last page that is like a WTF moment, like excited. Um, the whole book's pretty much Thor and Loki fighting, but uh, some good story in between there it sets up for how this Let final... Let them know about that last page. They want to know. I guarantee you they're in the chat right now saying, what's on that last page, Ryan? What's on that last page? <laughs> so at one point, it looks like Thor knocks Loki into the freaking sun, and then it's coming back, and then at the final last page in there, coming there's, there's a big old whole page of Gore the God Butcher. And it's just like... It's just... If you were to watch an episode and then like the last reveal was like someone that you wouldn't expect to see and it was just like holy cow, that's how I felt reading this last issue. I'm um, not the this first issue of Jason Aaron's last arc, but yeah. So if you're if you're at all specking on Gore the God Butcher, it's one of those ones to pick up because there's only only so many appearances per se. Um, so definitely one to pick, you kind of pay attention to. That Zafino variant seems to be the cover that people are gravitating towards. There was a lot of buzz on that a week or so going into um, this release. Um, so I expect that to be the cover to get. I have to say, that's one of my least favorite Immortal variants that I've seen yet. Yeah. Looks like there's some melting faces there. <laughs> yeah, it's like looking at a kaleidoscope or something. Yeah. But, um, but I will say also the Zafino art, it was out there like within previews it's not like it was like one of those incentive variants that you didn't know what the art looked like so i was surprised that um it wasn't more available and then i think at the time that uh the kubert variant during previews they were soliciting those as both as one in 25s but i also looked like this past week was at a one in 50 that turned into I, i'm not sure yeah i i only saw the solicit i saw the solicit as one in 25 and i was wondering when i originally saw that i've talked about this on the channel when you have two ratio, two books of the same ratio on a book, it tends to hurt them. I wondered if that was going to hurt the Safino variant, yeah. um, because so many people were specking on the Safino variant. 
Yeah. So I don't know if that was actually 125 or if it was a 1 in 50, but I know at one point they were both looked to be solicited. Not that I have a diamond account and saw it, but looking at DCBS and a lot of places where you order it from, the prices were about the same. That usually tells you, kind of gauge how the ratio is. But either way, fantastic issue. Still my favorite read so far. But I, like I said, I haven't had a chance to read Venom or a bunch of other books. Um, I read Batman, which stunk. King Thor, which was awesome, and Young Justice number eight, which is really great. But that's going to wrap us up for the Reader Buzz section this week. Uh, before we get into Variant Buzz again, everyone in the chat, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And again, please click that thumbs up button for us, and we're going to roll right on into the Variant Buzz. Starting with a book that's no stranger to this channel or anyone right now. We're talking about Once in Future number one, and this is the fourth print, right? Right. So this is the one that I think most people will be able to get their hands on if they like they tried to get those seconds, got allocated to the third, then they didn't quite get their thirds, and they got allocated to the fourth. I think the fourth will be the one that shows up the most. And because of that, you've seen a, a de-escalation in price from the second to the third to the fourth. But again, this is still... You know, you're still, uh, I think it was like a 12 to $15 book the last time I looked. Um, it's just amazing to be on the fourth print and like every every print go over $10. I mean, have we ever seen that before right out the gate from an indie title? So it's one of those things. I know there's probably going to be people in the chat who are, gonna get, who are still mad at Boom. You know, um, you can call us Boom Homers for how we feel about this, but I honestly would feel this way no matter what publisher um, did this. I think this was smart. I think it... It got buzz and it got attention, whether positive or negative, it was polarizing, a term I've used on this channel quite a bit. Um, people were interested to see um, what was going to happen, whether in, you know whether they were going to be able to get their copies. Um, there was a lot of people upset about the second print situation. Um, the third print went a little bit similar. But guys, that's a thrill of the chase. Um, and either way, you're looking four prints into a book and still a book that's selling well still a book that's great for speculation and um there's a part of me that believes the fifth print which i think will be much more readily available will still do extremely well right and i think they just announced what the sixth and final print for this book yes yes yeah. which kind of reminds me of a trend of another karen gillen book right they, right i mean die did the same thing i think they went to what they said they were doing a final on the sixth, right? Or went to and did a seventh though, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I think uh, there's some jokes about Once in Future doing that. I don't know. I don't know if they actually did do that, but yeah. that may be the way it goes. But yeah, still a great cover. And like we've said, each each one of these printings have a different cover up, which makes it kind of exciting. But I'm actually ready. I'm I want to read issue number two. <laughs> That's what I want to read. <laughs> but. The next on the variant buzz was Dark Age number two, and this is the one in ten incentive for this, right? Yeah, this I mean, this kind of followed the trend of Dark Age number one. Dark Age number one, now that one got up, I think, double what this one is. Um, up to about fifty dollars at one point. I think it's come down a good bit. But it was on the hot ten list for CBSI, comicbookinvest.com, Ben Stein, um, and the Tales from the Flipside crew who do the uh, hot ten show. Um, I think actually Brian, you and I talked about it in our brief foray into hot 10 comics um but this is uh this one is tw like 25 dollars right now creeping towards 30 um i think the cover art is the, is really driving these incentives great cover art very photo realistic um and you know the story had buzz from the get-go yeah um you know for it, issue number one had a lot of buzz the free comic book day issue was going to like eight to ten at one point i don't know what it's going for right now um, I think if they keep coming with incentives that look like this, I think they're going to do well. I think we may see $25 be that kind of standard price for these incentives. Shh, don't tell Midtown because then they'll start raising the price on it. Um, <laughs> you know, but but uh, Scorpion Comics, I'm looking at you. Um, so, uh, you know, it's one of those things where uh, if you can get these books, these if you can get these Dark Age incentives, if you can pre-order them for about $10, that may be a solid spec play going forward yeah and also make sure you check out their website because <laughs> a lot of times yeah. they'll have them available on their website you can't say shipping's the best but you gotta take that risk there but definitely check that out as well but the next book in the variant buzz section is something is killing the children this is the issue number one second print 
Yeah, and you know what? You just copy and paste what I said about, yeah. um, you know, once in future because this is the way this is going. I've mentioned something. I'm writing the Indie Spotlight Series article, which is an extremely popular article for the um, comicbookinvest.com, filling in for my brother in spec, Andy Tomlin, while he takes a little leave of absence. You know what I noticed about this book, Brad, that I found very interesting? And there may be some disappointed people when they get their books on eBay. So the image that you used right there, that's the stock image that was out on like previews in a lot of other places. But the actual book came out with trade dress on it, similar to... Uh, it came out very similar to the cover A, where it has like that kind of scrolled something is killing the children. If you list this book with stock, with that stock photo, at least this morning, you were getting about $20. If you actually had a picture of the book with the uh, trade dress on it, you were getting 12 to 15 So I think there's some people who were speculating on whether or not who were thinking they were going to get this, um, this like a virgin cover, for instance. And I don't believe that that's what these covers were. Um, I did not hit an LCS today, so I did not physically see this book on the shelf. And let's be honest, I'm again, I say this all the time, I'm in Rock Hill, South Carolina. I don't think I would have seen this on the shelf. This is a book I've got to pre-order to get my hands on. Um, but yeah, this is one that, I think there may be some disappointed eBay customers who, when they get their book in and see the trade dress and kind of realize they could have ordered this book cheaper, um, I definitely think that had an effect on it. And uh, that's something to keep an eye on going forward because I don't know if this is, this happens frequently. Maybe, um, maybe it does, and I just hadn't noticed it. It was just something I noticed this morning when I was really prepping to get that article out. Um, I had some personal family issues yesterday. So I was a little behind the eight ball. So self-admittedly, I didn't get the Indie Spotlight Series article out until um, close to noon or new, just thereafter. So, um, you know, it's that's one of those things where, um, you know, it, I was looking at that around noontime of what, what the effects of those two images are. So that'll have to be... Uh, to pay attention to going forward, but excellent cover art that's driving these late printings. Um, low printing, I'd be on the lookout for that third print as well for sure. Um, and this is another one where I don't know, maybe somebody did this, but if you if you were a retailer and you did an exclusive cover with just a virgin cover, I bet you would do really well on it. Just judging by the way people seem to gravitate towards the non trade dress version. And um, full disclosure, I like trade dress. I'm a marketing guy. Um, I think trade dress tells the story. Um, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and spoil something. Um, ben C is going to kill me. We're working on a, uh, a variant for CBSI, and we just added a little something textually to the book, and it makes the book. It makes the book ten times over what it was. And uh, it's funny uh, how sometimes a little detail like that can kind of sell a book better, but... Um, so I'm kind of a trade dress guy. I know a lot of people like the virgin covers, but um, sometimes the virgin covers frustrate me. You, you almost kind of you got to have a genetic memory to remember what they are all the time. But it's just me. Yeah, so I did put the, the art up there for what actually had the trade dress that you were talking about. But we're going to move on into the next one on the variant buzz list. And we are talking about this is the chastity book from dynamite right and we're talking about the variants for that yeah so like i'm not gonna talk about any one specific variant because there's so many of them and i'm not really familiar with this character i know she appeared in a couple of the other like series that dynamite's put out all i'm gonna say is man did dynamite go all out on the cover art for this book you're talking about clayton crane on the a and then he's got an incentive um where it's like the hellfire version of his cover a you got like three J. Scott Campbell covers. You've got Catherine Noden, um, who was putting out like hit variants for IDW. Um, can't remember off the top. Anita Baker was not Anita, ba Anita Baker. Uh, was it a <laughs> was it a Anita Blake or something like that? Uh, yeah. You know, uh, was putting out hit uh, variant covers um, for for that series. Um, you've got David Nakayama putting out variant covers on on this one you've got um i can't pronounce it, jay, jay Antel, antelicetto oh uh, um, yeah they did two of them yeah 
Anacleto. Anacleto. but we're going to say that right. I've never heard that name said, so I'm, I'm trying to, you know, put my South Carolina enunciation on it. But, uh, you know, um, Nick Bradshaw did a cover. So it's like they took all these, like, Marvel, you know, DC, IDW. Um, but, you know, Catherine Noden had buzz for IDW. Um, cover artists, they threw them onto this series. I don't know how heavy um, this one would have gotten ordered, but if I was running an LCS, this is one brand that would have tempted me to put a large order in to try to see if I could get my variant cover art customer base in on this one. And I don't know if that's how people played it. Um, it could easily have gotten ignored. But, man, there's a lot of heavyweight cover artists working on these books, and uh, this had to cost Dynamite some money to put these together. Yeah, one of the things is, like, I love the covers on this, but the Chaos co comic that Dynamite does that this character is also part of, you see a lot of those variants that are often in those midtown 70% sales. Yes. So that's what kind of sh shined me away. So this is definitely one of those buy it because you like it type thing, not because you're trying to spec on it. But No, yeah, I think this is more completionist yes. of certain variant cover artists. I am people who collect all the David Nakayama cards may may look for this one. And it's funny you mentioned Chaos because I think that's what that J. Scott Campbell black and white right. cover is. I think that's actually the Chaos cover, and then they colored in uh, Chastity, which I or which I think is a unique, you know, way to spin that cover. But yeah. I agree with you. So then next is the one wraparound variant that I was talking about that I like this week, and this is for Daredevil number eleven. This is. There's a couple other wraparound variants, but this is one that I definitely liked with the, the, the different heads and the, I mean, the different costumes and everything. Yes. It just kind of, it was a well-rounded wraparound variant. <laughs> I don't like wraparound covers because you don't see half the cover. But I think that these immortal variants, the ones that are done by the better artists, will make amazing like posters and prints. Like this would make an amazing poster on your wall. And I think the reason why this one works so well is kind of how you mentioned, like, there's been many, like, looks to Daredevil. So you've got kind of that Matt Murdock look. You've got that kind of early year one Daredevil look. Then you've got that yellow first appearance Daredevil costume. And then you've got that, you know, Daredevil costume, you know, that we were all familiar with, um, with the red and the black. And just the, the cover art just phenomenal on this one. It was the first like regular price variant to sell out at most retailers. Um, I don't think it was heavily ordered. Um, it's one that I could see if these things have some staying power, having some long-term success. Right. And then the next one in the variant buzz list is Catwoman number 15. This kind of is the art germ, but everyone looking at it, I mean, it's basically, it's Michelle Pfeiffer to me. Right, and they couldn't market it that way apparently because of um, they would have had to pay for like Michelle Pfeiffer's likeness, so they had to I guess do some changes to the cover art. But I'm gonna use this as an example of why people need to get off our backs about the pre FOC show because this is a book that people will point to and say, "Well, pre FOC talk ruined this." But you know how we found out about this book? We all got emails from every re retailer under the sun soliciting this book because as soon as you know, the cover art was shown. Every retailer became the physical um, emoji of, you know, the money dripping out of their mouth. Like, that's just exactly what happened when people saw this because this is a PC grab. If I ever saw one, who is a Batman, Gotham, Catwoman, any sort of fan, just a fan of pinup cover art, um, a fan of that movie? Who is a fan? There's so many different fandoms this plays to. Who doesn't want this cover? Can anybody look at this cover and go, you know, this is not knockout home run cover art. And what I really love is people were really like getting on our germ about, you know, being a one trick pony and kind of, you know, always putting out the same type of art. Here he goes in this, his last covers for this Catwoman run. He goes and he basically touches on every genre that Catwoman has existed in. And they've all been phenomenal. But to me, this is, you know, the, the creme de la creme. This is the top one. Maybe that's just me because that 89 Batman movie, and then I know that Catwoman's not from the 89 Batman movie, but that era of those original Batman movies, that was my, you know, early introduction into comic book uh, um, culture. Um, you know, I, I 
the movie came out when I was four years old. I don't. My dad had it on VHS. Um, I've talked about my father in this channel. You know, he recently passed, but you know, he introduced me to a lot of these characters, and you know, he showed me this movie when I was young. This was one of those movies that when there was nothing else on TV before we had nine million streaming services, you'd go into the drawer and pull out. Let, let's watch, you know, Batman Returns. Um, and so, you know, these original Batmans, I tell you what, if they ever do, you, you, all of you uh, uh, stores out there, it's probably too late, but FOC got pushed back. We're doing a year of the Joker variant. Somebody do a Jack Nicholson jo looking Joker variant. I'm all in on that. Um, but, you know, these kinds of, of books, I think, are popular. I would love to see our germ kind of do more versions can we get you know like a danny devito um uh you know copple pot uh <laughs> penguin you know but uh the you know i just think uh it, it hits me in the nostalgia and we talk about that a lot you know, brian about the success of nostalgia it hits guys like us man who are starting to get to an age like not that we're old but starting to get to an age where like you know you start to reminisce about your childhood we've got children and um you, you start to remember things that you enjoyed and you know batman and batman returns those two movies were it when i was a kid right then the next one we we're talking about on the variant buzz was justice league odyssey number 13 this is the lucio perillo variant yeah and the funny thing about this is this book had buzz as soon as this cover art was solicited people like azarel or azarel or however you want to pronounce that name um people like this character i've always liked this character i remember since i was a kid, it's always a character i don't really get because I'm not a big, like, Knights of the Round Table type of guy. I call those old-timey movies. Um, it just doesn't, you know, it's not, you're not going to get me to watch, like, I've seen I've seen Troy, uh, but the, like movie like that doesn't get me. Um, Gladiator doesn't get me. Get Ready to really, really hate me, uh, Simpleman's Comics Family. I've never seen an episode of Game of Thrones. Um, but, you know, uh, I will eventually. But uh, Hey, you got to you know, watch the last season. It was the best. <laughs> right that's right here but uh but no that's that's the beauty of it is I, I actually with those i know i can watch them at any time it's on the hbo app i'll get there but um these types of properties don't really do it for me so azrael never really was my type of thing uh one of my brothers was a big fan but perio killed this cover art i um, mean he does so well so often but he gets kind of ragged sometimes for his cover art being kind of dark like dark backgrounds and i just think that the kind of like fire look to the sword and everything really play well with this one but then you get the double add-on with the fact that yes this was popular upon solicit of people seeing the cover art but then we had jessica cruz death you know in the issue before so now i think people are also trying to check this book out to see what happens if you got to pick between cover a and cover b cover b has that cover art that just stands out right and then also for the variant buzz section we had Moon Knight, annual number one wraparound variant. And I'll be real quick on this one. This is, was probably the single most popular and most talked about um, of any of the immortal wraparounds. The second these books got solicited and cover art got shown, this is the one everyone talked about and gravitated towards. When we talked about um, the immortal wraparounds just being popular in general when they first hit, there were... Tons of comments in the comment section saying, well, I'm waiting on that Moon Knight one. That's the only one I want or, or you know, things like that. So no surprise here. This seems to be um, not necessarily a huge spec play, but very, very popular with collectors. Right. And then the last one for the variant buzz section, which I didn't have the art for, was Batman number 77 with a second print for that came out, right? Right. And uh, guess what, Brian? You don't need the cover art. I think I sent you a picture from eBay. Yeah. But, uh, you know, a quick 30-second bolo rant. DC Comics, I have called you out on this channel. I know you're not listening. Um, if somebody, anybody out there has a connect with DC Comics retailers, let them know. They are messing up. Look at what IDW, Boom. Look at Boom. We've talked about Boom. Look at what Boom is doing with these, with these later prints, switching the cover art. Here's here's Batman. We just talked about how 78 dropped the ball from the big reveal on 77. What would have been the easiest thing for them to do to 77? Just copy Marvel and take that splash page of Alfred getting his neck snapped by Bane. Make that the cover. You make that the cover, people are going to buy it. 
people are still feverishly into 77, they would have grabbed 77 second print, whether it really popped on the secondary market, wouldn't have mattered, it would have sold, you know, thousands of copies. Instead, you just change the background of the book to red, which is what they do. I mean, it's just, it's a punt. And I get why their thought is, I need to come out with a book that readers can get their hands on in case the speculators grabbed up issue 77, the first print. Here's a thought, do both. Do both at once. Switch the cover art. Yeah, they could have made a 1 in 25 incentive second print with the Alfred... <laughs> No, that's going too far. But they, I tell you what they could have done. They could have done one of their A and B type covers. Yeah. They could have taken that panel and made it the B cover. And then if they wanted to do their A cover for readers with the red or whatever, they could have done. They, there's a lot they could have done that they're just not doing. And they're, and they're messing themselves up. They already paid for the art. They already own the art. That's why Marvel does it. They don't have to go out and solicit a new cover. It's real easy. And let's be honest, a lot of people aren't reading these books. So to them, it's it's totally new art. Um, but either way, even if you're reading the book, you get to take an iconic moment in the book and make it the cover. It worked with uh, when Thanos, that Donny Cates run, that's just really worked with them. Um, you know, it's worked with Immortal Hulk. Um, it's worked with Venom. It's just worked with so many Marvel iconic runs. Man, Batman, they messed up with this one because... And, it, and you know what? If they go to a third print, if that's possible, listen, DC Comics. It's an easy move. Don't come back and then go black and white cover. You're just uh, you're missing money. You're missing opportunities. That's your chance to take market share. You got and the guy these guys copy everything that each other do. Marvel copies DC, DC copies Marvel. Whenever somebody's done something successful, copy this. It'll work. And at this point, you're the only ones left in the market consistently doing this. All right. And that's going to wrap up the Variant Buzz section. Real quick, before we get into the long-term play, you guys in the chat, you guys watching on the replay, or if you're listening on the podcast version, let us know in comments what did you guys like this week that maybe wasn't on the Bolo list. I know Young Justice number 8 came out. I enjoyed reading that. Flash is always one of my go-tos. Um, maybe not spec-wise, but definitely enjoying the reader buzz of Flash that came out. Um, Death of the Speed Force going on. But yeah, let us know in the comments, let us know in the chat. What are books you guys enjoyed reading this past week? Because we always love hearing about that. And it helps build the reader buzz for future titles on the Bolo list. Right, Jack? Yeah, and the truth is, like it's, this, you look at a week like this, there's probably five, six books I could have included on this list. Young Justice comes to mind for sure. Um, but, you know, let us know. DMs are open. Hit me up. Let me know. Hey, Mr. Bolo. You need to be paying attention to this book. I got enough people doing that, but, you know, we can always use more. Yeah. And once again, we've been asked, we've also explained before, independent. We don't really put first appearance for independent books on the Bolo list because the list would be ginormous because there's always right. first appearances coming out, especially in independent titles. But with that being said, we're going to roll right into Jack's long-term play for this week. And we are talking about... Pandemica number one. Yes, this is the book. Let me tell you something. I feel like I've been talking about this book all day, and I'll tell you why. Because if you go to comicbookinvest.com, you read that um, back issue bolo section. I'm talking about Jonathan Mayberry, the the writer of this series. If you go to the Indie Spotlight series, it's my pick of the week. Um, and again, mainly because of Jonathan Mayberry. Now, Jonathan Mayberry, if you're not familiar with him, he's considered one of the top ten horror writers in the world. Um, he has won several of Bram Stoker Awards, which is like the Horror Writing Award. He and he's did in V-Wars also, right? He that... did V-Wars, yep. He's a multiple-time New York Times bestseller. And what IDW did is they took this guy who writes novel series, and they had him adapt those novels into comics and come into the comics world. First one he drops is V-Wars. V-Wars takes off and is incredibly successful. Cover A, cover B is done by Kevin Eastman. You got a 1 in 25 and then a 1 in 100, which we've talked about this before. You don't see that from IDW. Usually you're getting that 1 in 10 and 10 of the Nets. Then he comes back right after that, and uh, the next series is Rotten Ruin. Now, Rotten Ruin is his big book series. This is what made him famous. There's like six of these books, um, and they were all like major bestsellers. And I think we're going to see more from that. Then he comes back and drops um, his take on like a, 
a, a George Romero kind of universe of characters with, um, I think it's what, Road of the Dead, Highway to Hell. And the interesting thing about this is if you look at these three series, it's a good predictor for this series. Because you got to look at what they've done. Um, v Wars came out the gate and was hot. And now it's kind of dropped back a bit. But people are sleeping on it because I tell you what's coming. A Netflix series. It's already been filmed. It, they haven't put a release date out. But the creators have said that it is very close. It's definitely coming in 2019 and we're already in September. So at some point in the next three months, V Wars is going to hit Netflix. And we know what happens with Netflix. And if, if you haven't read V Wars, it is an incredibly um, exciting series. Um, it is uh, it is a... I don't want to compare to Walking Dead because that seems to be dangerous, but I'll say at least the strain. It, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be incredibly successful, um, and it's got the best platform to do it on. You think, follows it up with Rotten Ruin, that immediately gets adapted. Um, that were optioned. That's been optioned. I think in April. Um, I can't remember what company optioned it, but they optioned it with like that dual option for TV or movie. Because again, it's it's a series. They could go. There's a lot they could do with it. And then he goes Road um, Road of the Dead, which has not been optioned yet. But it's important to note, that book was a hot 10 book when it came out. And the only reason why it's kind of fallen back a bit for cover A and cover B is IDW's got, this is another back issue bullet, IDW's got copies on their site right now of Road of the Dead. Um, and the 1 in 25 incentive, or 1 in 10 incentive sells for $25, and it's just a black and white cover. Now, why did I talk about all of those books before I talk about this? Because it is all the reasoning behind why I believe that this book will do well. I think that, first off, Jonathan Mayberry has the attention of Hollywood. He does short form, and these comic books are successful, and they, they give a storyboard to Hollywood uh, producers. Secondly, he can write long form because he's written these novels, so he can take these comic books and extend them out, which a lot of writers cannot do. Thirdly, we get an example of what happens on the market when these books come out. And this book, that's why I bring up Road of the Dead, even though that book didn't necessarily um, do what the first two have done as far as optioning, but that's yet. I, I Honestly, I think it's just a matter of time. Um, but people will comment on that incentive variant and say, well, it's just a black and white cover, but again, Road of the Dead, Highway to Hell, same look, $25. That's two and a half times um, ratio. This story, then I hit you with the solicit. You're talking about a group of diverse people, right? They come together, which we talked about diversity being important if you're talking Hollywood. That's what Hollywood wants to see. You can, you can give me a crap about that, but that's what Hollywood wants to see. So you have a group of diverse people get together, and they realize that there is like some secret government societies who are trying to kill off portions of our, our, you know, the human race uh, using, like, pathogens. And there's, like, this is systemic. And they decide to fight and kind of, like, group up and rise up against it. Tell me that doesn't sound like a Netflix series. Tell me that doesn't sound like that's, that's, you can just hear that as an elevator pitch and go, oh, yeah, I can see that. You throw some actors that people know in there and we're ready to go. Um... So when you factor in the fact that IDW is on a run with their creator-owned comics, when you factor in the history of Jonathan Mayberry as a writer, as a comic book writer, and as a writer with an ability to sell comics on the secondary market with what his series has done, this is a winner to me. This is a long-term winner. I think it's going to be a short-term winner, but I think it's going to be even more of a long-term winner. So even if this book doesn't perform in the next few days the way that maybe people had hoped... I think that there is a serious play on this book long term. I have zero, zero doubt that this book ends up getting adapted. I, I mean, I'll go ahead and put it on the line right now and say that this book is going to get optioned. Um, I have no knowledge. I'm not sitting here hitting you with those secret sources. Um, I have no knowledge of that, but I have no doubt in my mind. So if you were to ask me, like, what am I speculating on this week? I'm speculating on this book. Um, and at this point, Jonathan Mabry, um, I'm buying any series he drops because he's three for three with hits. Three for three with series is where you could have made money on him. Because even though IDW still has those Road of the Dead books, that, like I said, that book was a $15 book upon release. 
um, and the variant is still a profit maker. So I have no doubt this is a profit maker. If you didn't pick this one up and, you know, I at all made you maybe you missed it, hit that LCS, see if they still got that one on the shelf. And then another thing I think is cool is there's no cover B. So you have that cover A, and then you have that um, that incentive, which, again, reuses the art. And I think it only gives – reusing the art only gives more value to cover A because it really shows you, like, again, if this book gets optioned, what is the art that you're going to see? What picture are you going to see everywhere on Deadline, on The Hollywood Reporter, um, on Variety? And, by the way, those are sources that matter when we're talking about optioning, not cosmic book news and um, – you know, we got it covered and certainly not hype beast, um, you know, places like that. This is that's what you want. That's the cover art you're going to see. It's I would pay attention to it. Um, check out those articles. Uh, check out the back issue below where I go into more depth about those other other series. Check out the Indie Spotlight series. Shout out to my man, Andy Tomberlin, where I said this is this is my pick. Um, I'll go ahead and go on the record with this one. And I just want to say I love the trade dress switch where you get the. Um, the uh, red, white, and blue flag cover, I think it plays really well um, with the black and white cover. Um, so I think it gives a little color pop to an otherwise, you know, it is what it is, black and white cover. But that is why this is my long-term play of the week on a week where a lot of people are paying attention to Venom. A lot of people are paying attention to King Thor. A lot of people were speculating on first appearances and like Miles Morales and stuff like that. This is my pick, and um, I have... A good track record with these IDW books, and I feel good about this book. Yeah, I like how the baby on the cover is like in full mop gear, ready for yes. nuclear fallout. But uh, it yeah, lets you know, book. lets you know right from the cover what's going on here. Yeah, and also make sure if you want this, make sure you check out one. You check out slabheroes.com as well as check out frankies.com because that frankiescomics.com, excuse me, because they have both had those available up there if you were looking for those. Um, so definitely check those out. And that's going to be Jack's long-term play for the week. And that's also going to be the end of our Bolo list for this week, right? But we have, we have one more show this week, right? Oh, we do. We do. <laughs> the most controversial show in speculation, baby. And my new favorite show on the Simplements Comics YouTube channel. I'm talking about Last Call. The Last Call. Because it's last call, y'all. It's your last chance to get those orders in before FOC. Make sure you're locked in. Make sure you're getting those books at the right price. Make sure your your local comic uh, crack dealer, as I like to say, has you uh, has your fix taken care of. Uh, make sure that you are um, aware of everything that's coming out. Because, look, a lot of these releases come out, and even they, some slip by me. Gotham City Monsters is one that I, I didn't know about till today. I really had, had missed it altogether. And that happens That happens to the best of us. Not saying I'm the best of us, but I'm just saying that happens to, to anyone. So that is the point of FOC show. Um, we are highlighting 10 books. All the books, though, are listed on simplemanscomics.com. So you can go there on Friday. Check out that master list of every book that is on FOC. And you have till 10 p.m. on Monday, the following Monday, to get your order in and to make sure you are locked in. Uh, for those books uh, that come out in like three weeks. It's like 23 days bef before uh, those books release. And uh, we love that show. It's building momentum. Um, and we don't care about, what did you say, Brian? Those speculators. Speculators. Yeah, we like that. That's the, the we kind of end the week. It's a happy hour type theme. We're sitting in the bar. We're having drinks. We're talking about final order cutoff books that are going to approach the final order cutoff the following Monday night. But it's a good way to end the week on a high note. Be proactive instead of reactive with comic books. And then just talk to everyone and just say, hey, these are the 10 books that we like that are approaching FOC. You know, some are spec picks, some are great reads. Either way, we spoke to the Simple Man's Comics family, and they said that they wanted a video like that. So that's what we're doing. And we're more than happy, and we enjoy it. And it's just one of those things, like I said, I just love ending the week on that type of note. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we said that it's... Not every week is going to be great. Not every week is going to have the greatest list of books. But, um, you know, we're just giving you guys an idea of what we see when we look at uh, um, an FOC list. Because that's the point. We're talking about that. Integrity and transparency. That is what is paramount on the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel. So we're just giving you guys a look at what Brian and I look at. And the natural conversation about books Brian and I would have. Right. 
And with that being said, that's going to wrap up our show for tonight. And we hope to see you right here tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern for that final order cutoff show, The Last Call. If not, it's always available on replay and available in the audio version on the Simple Man's Comics podcast. And with that being said, from Jack and myself, we wish you guys good night. Been a little too nice to y'all. Now I got a price for y'all. Snake eyes on dice for y'all. Shoulders on ice for y'all. A6 all the hay. I won't get involved today. Got lost in the ball and A's. I'm flipping the bars. I'm flipping the, flipping the, flipping the. All record, all record. I still count wins when they got it. All record.